Well, good morning, Ireland. Did you have a good Christmas? Yeah, I had a good Christmas too. But I learned a few things from it. There were three generations there. Virtually the whole family was there. And strange enough, it looked like a church. A church is a family, isn't it? From the nappy sand right through to the walking sticks. Well, we weren't quite walking sticks there, but you know. And uh, I was reminded that uh, my sister and I have become the matriarch and the patriarch of the family. <laughs> Today I crack 71, so therefore I'm entitled to be there. My sister's 73, or well, she will be 73 a bit later in the year. Yeah. But what I noticed, and it's a wee bit scary, there was a time when these big family get-togethers at Christmas, it was very much Christian-centred, Seventh-day Adventist-centred. But that centre has moved outwards, and the outside has moved into the centre. My sister and I, okay, we were Seventh-day Adventists, have been so for many years. But um, the rest of the family don't want to know. So really, we were very much on the fringe. Very good meeting, but we were reminded of those things. Now, yesterday was New Year's Day, wasn't it? Did you make any New Year's resolutions? I once did years and years ago, but I made a resolution not to make resolutions. It's a waste of time because you're going to break them anyway, so why bother? Just do the best you can and hope for the best. And of course, when you look at today, it's the first Sabbath of the new year, isn't it? Yeah. How many more to go? 51. It's a long way to go, isn't it? And I thought to myself, what are you going to talk about today? I had, a, had planned on a particular sermon, but the Lord got in the way and said, no, not that one, that one. And as it's turned out, I think that was the right decision. The Lord knows better than we do. You now, look back to last week, Tucker told us, well, he almost prophesied, didn't he? He went right into the future, over a thousand years into the future. Revelation 21, verses 1 to 7. Very, 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 very futuristic. But I'm going to be rather more conservative than that. I'm going to stay within the, the immediate future. Now, I asked you about, are you going to make, did you make New Year's revolu rev resolutions? Well, I'm not quite sure whether I'm going to do this for the church here, but what we're going to talk about here this morning is something which we need to consider very carefully and keep it in front of us all the time because it's so easy to forget. But before we proceed into that, let's ask the Lord's blessing, shall we? Let's ask you to bow your heads. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're about to open your word. We're about to consider the, the great message contained in your word. It's so important, we perhaps don't always fully appreciate its value. But I just pray, Lord, that you'll challenge our thinking this morning, that you'll give us that sensitivity of mind to realise the value of what you have given to us. So bless us now, Lord, but first, forgive us for all our sins. Take away anything, Lord, that might clutter up our minds and uh, block our hearing you clearly. So bless us now, I pray in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Now, we human beings do an awful lot of talking, don't we? After that's what a sermon's about, isn't it? Rolling out the words. Have you ever wondered, though, how we would get on without words? I have a sneaky suspicion we would struggle, very much so. It would not be easy to communicate without words. Because words are all about communication, aren't they? And human beings are bent on communication. Have you noticed that? We're constantly talking. Newspapers, radio, television, discussion groups, parliament, the local city council, Sabbath school. Words, 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 words. We keep on talking. 
And of course, words are vehicles uh, for conveying ideas, emotions, instructions, and of course, gossip. And where would gossips be without words? But let's not forget, though, that time and usage can have quite an impact on words. That impact could be as simple as a change in spelling. You ever notice if you've been looking in the dictionary for a word to find out its meaning, and you go on to the end of the definition there, it'll have something of the history of the word. And quite often, for example, in English anyway, you'll find that words used to be spelt differently to the way they're spelt now. But nevertheless, the word still means the same. However, there are some words that time and usage had had a considerable impact on. The spelling may still be the same, but the meaning has been completely turned on its head, turned upside down. And of course, when the meaning changes, what happens to the message? It changes too, doesn't it? I've got an example here of this that I'd like to share with you. That's the word silly. If I was to tell you that you are a very silly lot, would you be impressed? I don't think you would, no. According to the dictionary, silly means to be witless, foolish, brainless, and simple. And of course, you are none of those things, are you? After all, you wouldn't be sitting here listening to my sermon if you were. However, there was a time when the when to call someone silly was a positive. It was even a compliment. In those days, silly meant happy, fortunate. Now, I'm sure you've heard of the Silly Isles. They're just off the southwest corner of England. The name is spelt S-C-I-L-L-Y. But it hasn't always been spelt that way. It used to be spelt S-I-L-L-Y. The Silly Isles with the Happy Isles, the Fortunate Isles, the Blessed Isles. But as the meaning of silly gradually evolved from a positive into a negative, the letter C was inserted into the name so the islanders wouldn't look foolish. That's just one example. But it does illustrate the effect that time and usage can have on words and their meaning, especially on the messages that they carry. Now, staying with that theme, there is a, another word that I would like to focus on this morning. A few years ago, that might be quite a few years ago, the meaning of this word suffered quite a bit from misusage. The news media was the, uh, the chief culprit in this process of misusage. They took a hold on this word and put an unjustifiably negative spin on its meaning and turn it into something of a buzzword. That word is fundamentalist. You ever heard of that word before? Fundamentalist. Thanks to the news media, fundamentalist became another name for someone who was seen to be fanatical, brainwashed, bigoted, even a threat to civilised society. And as far as I can tell, the chief targets for this fundamentalist tag were Muslim and Christian extremists. In those days, there were some Christian extremists. The title fundamentalist became a bit of a, a dirty word, a put-down word. It became a name for a particularly nasty disease. But I wonder, is the fundamentalist tag really all that bad? Despite the spin put on it by the news media, should I be embarrassed or ashamed if I was given such a title. You are a fundamentalist. Well, the answer is no, certainly not. To be, to be a fundamentalist is to belong to, be very, to belong to a very ancient and honourable profession. And with that in mind, it wouldn't do any harm if I was to define what a fundamental is. After all, as obvious as it might sound, a fundamentalist is by definition someone who advocates and hopefully follows the fundamentals. So what are fundamentals? Well, I've compiled a summary of the definitions from two dictionaries. Both of those dictionaries were very weighty tomes. I also checked out my thesaurus. 
So the basic definition of all these documents goes like this. A fundamental is a leading or primary principle, rule or article, which serves as the groundwork or foundation of a system. That's basically it. But to that I'd like to add a series of descriptive words that I gleaned from the dictionaries and the thesaurus. I think they help to make the meaning much clearer. I found words and phrases like intrinsic, essence, essential part, lifeblood, kernel, keel, indispensable, going to the root of things, serving as a necessary starting point. And on a lighter note, here are some words from my thesaurus of slang. Brass tacks, nitty gritty, nuts and bolts, groceries, bottom line, and of course my sermon title, meat and potatoes. Do you get the picture? Do you understand it? There's not a whiff of fanaticism in any of that, is there? In fact, when you think about it, the application of the fundamentals is essential, dare I say fundamental, to so much of what we do as human beings. We need to get the fundamentals right if we want to make a success of whatever endeavour we undertake. If we don't get the right, sooner or later, we'll find ourselves up to our ears in custard. Now, early on, I said that to be a fundamentalist is to belong to a very ancient and honourable profession. And that is true. It's so old, in fact, it predates what is termed as the oldest profession. It even predates sin. Because remember, God is the ultimate fundamentalist. The ultimate now, I don't think I'd be overstating the case if I was to say that all the Bible writers were fundamentalists. And I guess that Moses would have to be the first fundamentalist in the Guild of Bible Writers. His writings, especially the early chapters of Genesis, fairly hum with concepts which are fundamental to our faith. These concepts are foundational to the story and the message of the Bible. If we were to discard any of them, our faith would become meaningless. So in the light of that, we're going to spend some time marinating ourselves in the first four chapters of Genesis. I hope you're going to have your Bibles on your lap, open at Genesis. And from that framework, those first four chapters, I'm going to sift out eight fundamentals that I'm going to focus on. It's a nice sound, all those rattling pages. I can't hear the tablets working, but never mind. So where do we begin here? What's the first fundamental? Well, I think the best place to start is in the beginning, don't you? In the beginning. But where do we find that? Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, right. And what does Genesis 1, verse 1 say? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. For us, you can't get much more fundamental than that, can you? I don't know about you, but I believe in the Big Bang Theory. God spoke, and what happened? Bang, it happened. The Bible states that God created this world and everything in six literal days. He spoke it into existence. That is fundamental number one. And what was the quality of that creation? We'll take a look at verse 31 there. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. And by the way, I'm quoting from the New International Version. God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Yea, it was perfect. And all that God created over those six days, those six literal days, there was not so much as of a hint of decay or a bent toward deformity. Everything animate and inanimate had been designed and built to last forever. That is fundamental number two. Then at the end of the sixth day, God created one more thing. And what was that? Genesis 2, verses 2 to 3. Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 to 3. Verse 2 says, By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing, 
So the seventh day he rested from his work. Verse 3, and God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. God set the seventh day aside as a memorial, a celebration of his creative energy, his creative power. But more than that, God gave to the seventh day something which he has never given to any other day of the week. Having set it apart for a a divinely ordained purpose, God then endowed its hours with his blessing and his holiness. The seventh day Sabbath is fundamental number three. Now, for fundamental number four, we need to backtrack a little to the sixth day of creation. Tell me, after God had created this world with its sun, moon, atmosphere, vegetation, fish, birds and animals, etc., what special being did he create? Man, right. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Verse 26. Then God said... Let us make man in our own image and let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Man was created in the image of God. That's what Moses wrote. But then a little while later, he qualifies that statement. Notice Genesis 2 verse 7. Genesis 2 verse 7. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Or as the New King James says, a living soul. It is true that God, it is true that Moses said God created man in his own image. True. However, despite that divine imprint, and despite being designed and built to last forever, man was not invested at creation with an immortal essence. You know, we talk about man being made in the image of God. Man was made of dust, God wasn't. Genesis 2 verse 7 doesn't say the man received an immortal soul. You notice that? He doesn't say he received one. It says the man became a living soul and not an immortal one at that. In other words, man's existence as a conscious living being started at the moment that the Lord God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Before that, man was nothing more than beautifully formed slab of meat. Beautifully formed, but nevertheless, just raw meat. And before that, merely dust. The man was in no way a reincarnated being. He was in no way a fallen angel being given a second chance. Prior to the events described in Genesis 2 verse 7, man had no existence except as a thought in the mind of God. In the light of subsequent events, that is very significant. This brings us to fundamental number five. And that leads us very nicely to this. And while it is fundamental number five, it is divided into what might be described as two closely connected, yet mutually antagonistic parts. In a way, each is a fundamental in its own right. But because they're so closely connected, I've put them together. The first part is found in Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 and 17. Verse 15, And God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But verse 17 it says, But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, What does it say? You will surely die. Man was created with the potential to live forever, but only on the condition that he remained faithful and obedient to God. The man was not immortal. He was living dust. His life could be terminated. 
That's the first part of fundamental number five. Now, what was Satan's response to God's promise to the man that he would surely die if he disobeyed? What did he say? <laughs> you will not surely die. No. That's the other part of fundamental number five. Two fundamentals within one. One from God, one from Satan. God said, you will surely die. Satan said, no, you won't surely die. No way. God said, death is the consequence of sin. Satan said, no, it isn't. No way. God said, death is the end of life. Satan said, no, it isn't. Death is a doorway into another and better life. That's number five, fundamental number five completed. And of course, bound up in that was Adam and Eve's fall into sin. This is where fundamental number six comes in. In that first act of disobedience, man moved from a state of intimate oneness with God to a state of estrangement from God. Now, before Adam and Eve sinned, there was a part of their being that they were not fully aware of, a part of their being that so far they had little reason to explore. That part was their conscience. We're all fully aware of our conscience, but I suspect they weren't really aware of it. Now, so long as they responded positively to the promptings of their conscience, it would act like a magnet drawing them to God. But as we know, they did reject the promptings of their conscience. They did disobey God's clear instructions. They did sin. As a consequence, they felt the impact of a rejected conscience. They felt its sting. That's the first time they ever felt anything like that. That became very obvious to Adam when he said to God in Genesis 3 verse 10 there, notice that Genesis 3 verse 10, I heard you in the garden. Remember God was looking, he says, where are you Adam? And he says, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. Adam and Eve felt naked. Why did they feel naked? Well, because they had lost their sinlessness. Their sinless innocence was gone. It left them naked. They came to realize that God and sin are mutually exclusive. They repel each other. Because we know that ourselves. They came to realize that sin had repelled them from God's very presence. They came to realize that the wages of sin would indeed be death. Dust you are, and to dust you return. The entrance of sin and death into this world is fundamental number six. Right, what's fundamental number seven? Well, I think the answer to that has to be Genesis 3 verse 15. This is one of those texts which... Most of us, I think, have some memory of. Genesis 3, verse 15. In this text, I get the impression that God is there, there's Satan, there's Adam, and there's Eve. And God is talking to them. And he delivers them what might be termed a defining promise. Verse 15. And I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. In that brief statement, God was drawing a line in the sand. And I think he was particularly talking to Satan there at the end. He was saying to Satan, you might think that you have won. But I've set in place a plan that will eventually see you and your evil plans judged, condemned, and destroyed, and humanity restored to divine favour. That's the promise of that verse. Genesis 3.15 contains the germ of God's solution to the consequence of Adam and Eve's sin. However, while it isn't stated in so many words, that can't have been all that God revealed to them about his plans to save humanity. Take a look at Genesis 4, verses 2 to 4. Genesis 4, verses 2 to 4. Verse 2. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. 
In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel bought fat portions of some of the firstborn of his flocks. Now let's ignore for the moment the difference between their sacrifices and ask the question, why did they bring those offerings to God? Was it their own idea or did God ask them to do it? Well, I believe that it was God who asked them to bring the offerings. And I also believe that God told them why he asked them to bring those offerings. Here was the beginning of the sacrificial system that represented and pointed forward to the ultimate sacrifice for sin. Jesus Christ, Son of God, Saviour. Here in symbolic form was God's answer to sin and its consequences. Okay, so far we've looked at seven fundamentals. There's one more that I would like to focus on. Now, it may be the last, but brothers, this is it's by no means the least. History has proven this again and again. And just like fundamental number five, fundamental number eight is made up of two closely connected yet mutually antagonistic parts. So what are these two parts? Well, the two parts of this of the, the two parts are the sacrifices that Cain and Abel brought to God. Go back to Genesis 4 once again. Verse 2. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flocks. The Lord looked with favour on Abel and his offering. But notice verse 5, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favour. Two offerings. One was accepted, one was rejected. God was pleased with Abel's offering, but he wasn't pleased with Cain's offering. Now, I've no doubt that the, uh, the fruits that Cain brought to God would have been of the very finest quality. They were so close to where sin began, the original Garden of Eden, that decay would not really have been as bad as it is today. Those fruits would have been beautiful. So why was God displeased? Well, quite simply, Abel's one offering was an act of faith. Faith in God and faith in the promised Redeemer. And of course, Abel's offering was the one that God had asked for, the one that symbolized the promised Redeemer. On the other hand, Cain's offering was not an act of faith. It was not the one that God had asked for, and it did not represent the promised Redeemer. Cain's offering was the first example of salvation by works, or as you could also put it, salvation on the DIY plan. And that, of course, raises the question, if the idea for Cain's offering didn't come from God, where did it come from? Well, obviously, there's no, there's no other way it could have come from. That's Satan. When Satan heard God's plan to save humanity from sin and its consequences, he set about setting up a counterfeit, a false plan of salvation, a red herring, if you like, it was designed to stand in place of God's true sacrifice. Here was the first Antichrist. It looked good on the outside. It looked similar to God's plan, but inside it was worthless. But that didn't matter to Satan. So long as it achieved his goal, that was all that mattered. And what was his goal? Eternal death for Adam and Eve. He thought he'd achieved that when he tricked them into eating the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So the last thing he wanted was for them to regain eternal life through God's plan of salvation. The trick now was to persuade them to obey or to buy into his false plan of salvation. However, I think we can fairly safely say that his efforts with Adam and Eve failed. They failed miserably. As the old saying goes, once bitten, twice wary. They would have been aware of Satan and his tricks. But when Cain and Abel were born and grew up, Satan focused his sales pitch on them. And as we know, he succeeded with Cain. Hence the difference between their sacrifices. Now, I said that there were two parts to fundamental number eight. But in reality, there are three. I just kept that one tucked under my sleeve just to keep you guessing for a while there. 
You see, Cain didn't just buy into Satan's false plan of salvation. He also bought into Satan's spirit. So when God showed displeasure over Cain's offering, that spirit came to the fore. Instead of being humble and teachable, Cain was, as it says there in Genesis 4 verse 5, very angry and his face was downcast. Cain was angry with God and he was angry with his brother. Cain was angry with God because he had rejected his sacrifice and he was angry with Abel because of his example of faithfulness to God and his true worship. Abel's life was an affront to Cain and a constant reminder of his lack of faithfulness to God and his false worship. Of course, God tried to reason with Cain. Genesis 4 verses 6 and 7. Genesis 4 verses 6 and 7. Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? Verse 7. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. And did Cain manage to master the sin that was crouching at his door? No, he didn't. I don't think he even wanted to. Genesis 4 verse 8 says, Cain said to his brother, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. That's the third part of that fundamental. Now this might sound a bit strange to, strange to you for me to describe the combination of Cain and Abel's sacrifice and the subsequent murder of Abel and by Cain as a biblical fundamental. But they are. They are the fundamental. What happened between Cain and Abel established a pattern that has haunted God's church ever since. It has been an unbending and unavoidable law of cause and effect. You have the spirit of Cain here, and you have the spirit of Abel. You have Cain's unfaithfulness. You have Abel's faithfulness. You have Cain's false sacrifice. You have Abel's true sacrifice. You have Cain's false worship. You have Abel's true worship. You have Cain's false witness, and you have Abel's true witness. And ever since Cain and Abel established that pattern, those opposites have been the loggerheads within God's church. Now let's go over to the New Testament now, shall we, to the book of John. First chapter. John summed up the conflict very well. John chapter 1, and we'll look at verse 5. John chapter 1, verse 5. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. But not only has the darkness not understood the light, it also hates the light. And why does it hate the light? We'll come over to John chapter 3. And we'll look at verses 19 and 20. And I think these are the words of Jesus. John chapter 3, verses 19 to 20. Verse 19, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because of their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. And that is basically why Cain murdered Abel. And of course, that made Abel the first martyr in God's church. But of course, he won't be the last, will he? One of the history's lessons is that when, a, when the ables of God's church have stood up for the truth in opposition to falsehood, all too often the outcome has been inevitable. Over the millennia, countless Cains have murdered countless ables. And because men love darkness instead of light, they will do that sort of thing. It's inevitable. Now, just pause at this point, shall we? I want to get a point clear here. I want to define this term God's church. And I've used this a couple of times here now. You need to know what I think God's church is and how I'm going to use that term. In the context of my sermon, it doesn't refer to a particular denomination. It includes all professed Christians. It's anyone who claims to belong to the body of Christ. Do you understand that? 
I wouldn't want, to wouldn't want you to misunderstand that. Right, let's get back to the sermon at hand. Now, I don't know if it's ever occurred to you, but as I see it, there is a, a mystery attached to Satan's counterfeit plan of salvation. And that mystery is its ongoing success in God's church. You notice that? And that success is a mystery because of the counterfeit's lack of support from God's word. It didn't get any divine support when it was first promoted in God's original church way back there at the entrance to the Garden of Eden. God simply chilled it out. And it doesn't have any more support today. Yet despite that, it continues to thrive in God's church. That's truly amazing. And that also applies to the many other counterfeits that Satan has successfully crafted and grafted into God's church. And it would seem that the majority of Christians have, like Cain, consciously or unconsciously bought into Satan's counterfeits. Even when confronted with the truth about Satan's counterfeits, most don't want to know. Have you noticed that? Go away. The majority seem to prefer darkness rather than light. Light is very inconvenient at times. The fundamentals of God's word have been lost sight of by much of the Christian world. The fundamentals are no longer seen to be fundamental. Their place has been taken by, by things like the theory of evolution, Sunday sacredness, the immortality of the soul, the mass, the Virgin Mary, the idea that the Ten Commandments were, what, were done away with at Calvary. And of course, then there's cheap grace. And there is what I would describe as a, a vague sort of Christian atheism. Ever heard of that? A vague sort of Christian atheism. When I look at God's church today, it appears to be heavily weighted in favour of Cain. To be enabled means to belong to a rather small and seemingly unimportant flaky grouping. And you'll be seen to be flaky because to truly be an able, you must be a fundamentalist. And the message that God has given to the Seventh-day Adventist Church to preach to the world is all about those fundamentals. It's all about the fundamentals laid down in the first four chapters of Genesis. I want you to go back to, uh, I'm sorry, to go to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. And take a look at verse 6. And notice how it begins. It refers to the eternal or the everlasting gospel. Notice that? And what is at the very, and what is at the very heart of this gospel? It's Jesus Christ and his single, perfect, all-sufficient atoning sacrifice for sin. And that is what Abel's sacrifice pointed forward to, isn't it? The true sacrifice, undiluted by satanic invention. The next on the list is the judgment. The first part of verse 7 says, Fear God and give him glory, for the hour of his judgment has come. Now, we call this judgment the uh, investigative judgment. Now, as I see it, there's a, a close relationship between Revelation 14, verse 7, and Genesis 3, verse 15. Both of these texts are talking about a process of sifting, of separation, and ultimate accountability. In Genesis 3, verse 15, as you remember, God says to Satan, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers, ever since Adam and Eve sinned, the people of this world have been separating into two camps, either the camp of God or the camp of Satan. The investigative judgment of Revelation 14 verse 7 is the final step in that process, and it will end just before Jesus' second coming. This judgment will see the salvation of the righteous confirmed for eternity. What follows will be the fulfillment of the last part of Genesis 3 verse 15. You remember what it says? He will crush your head 
and you'll, he will strike your heel. Jesus was obviously talking directly to Satan there. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This text is saying, indeed, Satan would inflict some injury on Jesus. That's inevitable. We saw that happen in his life. He would strike his heel. But ultimately, Jesus will crush your head. He will destroy you. Satan and all he stands for and all his followers will suffer eternal extinction. That's the message there. Sin will be gone forever. Then in the latter part of Revelation 14, verse 7, the first angel restates one of the key fundamentals. This, not just the first of the, not just of the first two chapters of Genesis, but in fact of the whole Bible. Verse 7, worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. The Bible states explicitly again and again that God created everything, full stop. All too often, God identifies himself as creator. I am God, I created everything. That's his identity, that's his tag. So along with the everlasting gospel and the judgment, God's role as creator of all things is very much a part of the first angel's message. But to embrace such a, a supposedly unscientific belief in this day and age is to risk being tagged a flaky Christian fundamentalist. A bit of a flat earther, if you like. Indeed, such a belief does make one a fundamentalist, very definitely. Then to compound that, if one observes the day that God set aside as the memorial of that creation, of that creative work, one becomes even more of a flaky fundamentalist. Now at this point, the question arises in my mind. Is the first angel telling us in verse 7 that to truly worship God, Christians need to keep holy the seventh day of the week as the Sabbath? Is such a call a part of the first angel's message? Well, some would say, yes, it is. But I would suggest that Revelation 14 verse 7 does not actually say that. I'd rather have a bit more solid proof on my side. Even though, of course, that verse does give that idea a nudge in that direction. There's more that's needed here. For me, it's nowhere near explicit enough. But if we take the first angel's reason for worshipping God and we couple it with verse 12, <coughs> then we have quite a strong case for answering my question with a yes. Notice verse 12. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. That verse clearly states that in the last days, one of the recognition marks of God's saints, his faithful ones, is that they will obey his commandments. All nine of them, right? All ten, that's right. No, not just nine of them, but all ten of them, the whole lot. And of course, that includes the fourth commandment, the commandment that calls us to keep the seventh day holy. It doesn't mention anything about the first day of the week there, does it? That is one of the Ten Commandments. And those same Ten Commandments have been binding on mankind ever since God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life and he became a living soul. The message of Revelation 14 verses 7 to 12 is that the fourth commandment is as binding on God's church today as it was on Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Now tell me, what word does the fourth commandment begin with? Remember, remember right. And unless I'm much mistaken, remember is the opposite of forget. Have I got that right? Yes. But rather than remember, <clears throat> much of God's church seems to have forgotten, if they ever knew, that the seventh day is God's Sabbath. And all too often those who do know choose to ignore the finer details of the fourth commandment. They sometimes even go so far as to, to, to use the exclusive the Sabbath text to promote Sunday sacredness. But just like Cain's sacrifice, the Sunday Sabbath has no concrete support in God's word. The historical reality is that the change of the Sabbath from the seventh day to the first day was only one part of a much larger process inspired by the father of lies. 
You know, you go back to those early centuries of the Christian era, era, Satan set out to replace fundamental truths of God's word in God's church with his deceptions. And in that, he was eminently successful, eminently successful. Once again, the stage was being set for the Cain versus Abel tragedy to be played out in God's church. Then, over the next 1260 years or so, the truth and its able supporters were almost snuffed out. And in our day, despite the Reformation, the fundamental truths of God's word are still very much the poor cousin to the false teachings within God's church. The tension between truth and error in God's church is still with us today. And when you read Revelation 13 in conjunction with the three angels' message, it's obvious that the Cain versus Abel scenario is going to be played out again in God's church, only this time on a worldwide scale. So where do Seventh-day Adventists fit into this Cain versus Abel scenario? Well, here's an illustration I think helps to answer that question. Do you know what the letters D and A stand for? Is anybody brave enough to shout it out? Yeah, I said shout it out, not whisper it. Thank you. Deoxyribonucleic acid. Right. According to the dictionary, DNA is a substance in chromosomes that stores genetic information. Basically, DNA holds the blueprint for life. Your life my life, the life of everything in this world, animate and inanimate. As well as that, our DNA determines things like our skin colour, our body shape, our sex, our intellectual leanings, and what sort of hair we have or haven't, etc. Now, so long as everything in our DNA is in order, that's okay, no problem. Even if we aren't particularly wowed by our body type, but if your DNA is damaged in any way, it can produce physical and mental deformities of various degrees, from the barely noticeable to the obscene and tragic. Now, I might be stretching your point here, but I believe that the first four chapters of Genesis contain the DNA for the rest of the Bible. Those four chapters are foundational, yea, fundamental, to the Bible's story and message. And those four chapters are certainly fundamental to the three angels' messages. God's last warning message to this world before Jesus' second coming. But let's not stop there. Might I suggest that the letters DNA can stand for more than just deoxynucleic, sorry, deoxyribonucleic acid. They can also stand for do not alter. Do not alter the Bible's story and message or else... That is certainly the message contained in Deuteronomy chapter two, verse sorry, Deuteronomy four, verse two, and Revelation twenty-two, verses eighteen and nineteen. Now, don't go digging for it because I'm going to just read them through as though they were one item. Do not add to what I command you, and do not subtract from it. What, but keep, but keep the commands of the Lord your God. And who's talking here? It's God, isn't it? I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes words away from this book of prophecy, God will take away from him his share in the holy city, sorry, the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. The message of those verses is very plain, isn't it? You couldn't misunderstood it, could you? could you? It's saying to all the members of God's church, don't try, for whatever reason, however well-meaning, to disobey, dull down, dilute, modify, or replace any part of the story of the message of God's word. Keep your hands off. But those are the very things that Satan has spent thousands of years trying to persuade God followers to do. He knows that the Bible is the only place that we can go to get an accurate picture of God, an accurate picture of the origins of Satan and sin, and an accurate picture of God's plan for our salvation. 
But tragically, all too often, Satan has been eminently successful in steering God's followers away from following a clear, thus saith the word. He started by deluding, by deluding Adam and Eve. Then he deluded Cain. Then Israel came under Satan's spell. And latterly, he has deluded the Christian world. He has deluded the Christian church. Satan is now standing before our door, the door of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's now your turn. It's my turn to be manipulated, to be manipulated and maneuvered by Satan into helping in the process of altering the Bible's DNA, of deforming and neutralizing its story and its message. To yield or not to yield, that is the question. If we allow ourselves to be carried along by Satan's subtle promptings, we'll eventually cease to be able and we'll become like Cain. Jesus is coming again, soon. He's coming to rescue his faithful followers and bring an end to Satan and sin. But just before he comes, there's going to be one final climactic confrontation between Cain and Abel. The spirit of Satan versus the spirit of, a, of Christ. The unfaithful versus the faithful. The false sacrifice versus the true sacrifice. False worship versus true worship. The false Sabbath versus the true Sabbath. The false witness versus the true witness. In this great final battle between Cain and Abel, what do you want to be? What do I want to be? Do we want to be a Cain or do we want to be an Abel? The choice is ours. Both Satan and Christ are waiting to hear our answer. Thank you.